Hey folks, how you doing? Welcome to WWGOA Live for August 10th, 2017. Uh, thanks to our sponsors, Typebond, for helping keep this free for you. And I think, Krista, you got questions queued up, so jump right in and uh, let's see what kind of damage we can do here. All right, our first question comes from John. Hello, John. John. John says, I'm a gold member looking for a good woodworking drill press. There are so many choices and I want to do this right one time. Please give me your recommendations on the floor model you would choose. Thank you very much. Um, well, drill presses are boring. Um, let's look at this one, Kristen, and we can show them a feature. If you can, you don't really have to wheel this way, but you could maybe zoom a little once you're pointed in this direction. So I don't, I don't know a ton about drill presses. I haven't done a tool test or anything, um, but I can tell you on this one, a feature I really like, is at its variable speed so it's got a dial on it so I never have to mess with a belt so on a lot of drill presses you would open the shroud here and you would change uh, the belt position on step pulleys with this one that's my speed change and it's got a readout here that then tells you how fast you're going so very convenient and uh, Part of what will come from that is you'll actually change speeds. Uh, the new Nova uh, drill press is interesting. It's got a similar kind of a speed control. I think there's a Powermatic that's got a similar speed control. So uh, that's certainly worth shopping for. And then other than that, uh, I, you know, as far as name and other names or brands or models that I'm aware of, like I said, I haven't done a tool test on them. So uh, I'm not sure what else to point you. But that, that kind of speed control is a really good feature. Okay, thanks George. And we have another question from a different John. He says, Hello, John. I recently got some rustic lumber from my grandfather's house. They were in shed, so there's no water that got onto them. How do I know if they're good enough for a project? Well, you sound like a good candidate for a moisture meter. Um, moisture meter will let you determine, oddly enough, the moisture of the material. And based on that, you'll have a good idea if it's ready to use or not. If it's wood that's been air dried, is going to be down around 12% or so. Wood that's been kiln dried will be around 6 to 8%. So if you're 12% and under, then the stuff should be ready to go. All right. Um, Paul would like to build a storage slash workshop. And he has approximately... A storage workshop for Slash? Like from Guns N' Roses? Yes. Yep. Wow. He wants what to a nice build guy. Slash a storage workshop. Nice. Yep. He has approximately eight feet wide and four feet deep is the dimensions he has. And he is six feet tall. What do you suggest the height should be with such a small area to build? And what type of wood is good for this? Well, two by fours and two by sixes for wood. I mean... Go to a home center, um, pre-cut studs are, I'm having a mind blank, they're either 92 and 5 eighths or 93 and 5 eighths, 92 and 5 eighths, I think. So pre-cut studs with a bottom plate and then two top plates will give you an eight foot ceiling. So I don't know why you wouldn't do an eight foot ceiling. So that'd be my suggestion. All right, thank you. Um, Dennis would like to know, George, what is your opinion on the best 10 inch compound sliding dual bevel miter saw, say that five times fast, yeah. for his wood shop. He's replaced his Protec 10 inch single bevel miter saw about 15 years ago, getting ready for retirement so he's got lots of daily shop time. Thank you. He loves the show. He watches them every time. Thanks for watching every time, Dennis. So um, we have a review on GOA and I'll link to it in the answer an hour from now when I'm sitting and answering. Uh, Paul, or no, I'm sorry, David Radke did a review on a DeWalt saw that he really, really liked. Um, here in my shop, I've got a Bosch miter glide um, that I'm very happy with. I believe both mine is a 12 inch. I think the one David reviewed is also a 12. Um, for most in the shop stuff, a 10 inch would be fine. And uh, I've also got a 10 inch Festool Capex here, which is a wonderful saw. Um, and outside of that, you know, to be really fair, it's like the drill press answer. I haven't tested side by side the DeWalt against the Milwaukee, against the Rigid, against the whatever other brands I'm missing here. So um, 
My personal experience, like I said, the Bosch is great, the Festool is great. David really liked that DeWalt. And outside of that little family, um, I'm not super up to speed on what the other companies are offering. So a lot of, there are a lot of saws out there. Okay. So Dennis should. Well, I, I always say with this kind of stuff, more so than getting an opinion of one, which is even me here, um, if, if you can find a magazine that did a tool test, Wood Magazine does a lot of tool tests. So I would Google tool test dual compound miter saw and see what comes up. And tool tests are great because side by side by side they're comparing the whole family. And that's the best way to get an objective opinion. All right, thank you, George. Um, Fred and Dot are just letting you know that they're new to all of this woodworking. They're trying to take in as much information as they can. And they're into crafty parts like building shelves for small craft rooms. So thank you for the show. Oh, no question? No, it's oh, just Okay, a nice thanks comment. for the nice comment, Fred yeah. and Dot. It's always good to hear positive comments. Um, Edward would like to know, how does one measure the wood for a picture frame, no miters, where the four corners are staggered for embellishment? Not sure what, well, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I know what he means. I think Edward may have submitted this question previously. And Paul and I have tried to answer it a couple times. But let's see what happens here. So here's what I would do if it were me. I would take, drawing is always good. And if you can draw, like my friend Paul uses SketchUp all the time. Um, I have yet to learn SketchUp. But I, by staggered pieces, I'm going to think, you mean this? Bloop. Um, and I call that each piece chasing the other one is the way I phrase that. So um, pick your picture dimension. If that's five by seven, that's not the opening because you're probably going to cut a rabbit. So th this is exactly how I would do this if I were you. I would draw this full size and in fact paper like this would be perfect. Uh, it's probably hard to see on the camera, but there are one inch squares on this. So you could use those one inch squares draw this to perfect size, exact size. If this is five by seven, there's probably a rabbit out here that's maybe three eighths of an inch wide. That's gonna be where your five by seven is. Sketch all that out, add the width of these pieces, whatever they are, and then when you're done, once you have that drawn, you'll be able to simply measure from there to there, and that'll be the length of that piece. Measure from there to there, and that'll be the length of that piece. And I think that's the best way to pull that off. All right. Full, full size drawings, scale drawings are always a wonderful thing. All right, thanks George. Um, our next question, a viewer says, my son bought me a 14 by 40 lathe. I want to turn bowls, vases. 14 by 40, wow, that's, that's big, says, nice. Yeah. I want to turn bowls, nice son. vases, etc. What chuck should I get? Well, you, let's see, so you could probably stay there and I'll come back eventually. Uh, so I think what we're, what we're asking about here are chucks like this. This is a, a four jaw chuck or people call it a scrolling jaw chuck. And this is what I would get is some kind of four jaw chuck like this. Um, did I grab the right, yep. So what's cool about this is we can turn a bowl that has a recess on the back. And then when I turn these in that direction, those jaws will expand into the recess. When I turn them in this direction, they'll also constrict on stuff. So um, for me with my bowl turning today, this is the type of jaw or type of chuck I use all the time. I really never use a face plate anymore. Um, everything I do is on a chuck like this. So a four jaw or scrolling jaw chuck is the way to go. And then when you shop for that, um, within a given company's line, there'll be different chucks available and the one that you buy will depend on the size of bowls you plan on turning. So bigger bowls are going to be chucks with larger jaws. Um, so again, if you stay right there, I should have just done this on the first trip. This is the 
exact same device but on a bigger scale. So when you when you pick your which size chuck you're going to get, it's going to be based on the parameter of what size bowls you're going to turn. And you've got a mechanical uh, capability of holding stuff based on their jaw size. Okay, thank you, George. Um, yet another John. There's so many Johns out there. Three Johns. Must be a popular name. Um, John had the opportunity to use his router table as a jointer for the very first time. Attaboy, John. All he can say is, sweet. It does work great, doesn't or, it? sweet. Sweet. Right. The question now arises, how thick can I go? I am using a two and one quarter horsepower router and one half inch collet. How long a bit can I use? In my experience, and it's not about the... It's not about the horsepower of the router because it doesn't take much oomph to make this happen, but it's more about. Um, all right, stay there again, and I'm going to come right back. I think probably most likely, but you never know. Anything can happen. I opened the wrong door. Taking longer than I thought. All right, here we go. So. This is a case where it's not about horsepower, it's just about the dynamic of the cutter. There's a spiral router bit with a cut length of, I could tell you what the cut length is, a cut length of two inches. So theoretically, we could use this for jointing two inch material. What I find is just that um, when we're using the entire cutter, the top here maybe starts to flutter just a little bit and you get some degradation of cut quality. So in general, for me jointing on the router table, somewhere around an inch and a half or so in hardwood is about your maximum capacity. Um, you get a longer bit, you could certainly try it um, and see how performance goes for you. But yeah, somewhere around an inch and a half or so is it kind of starts to lose its effectiveness. Okay, thanks George. And John S. has a question. Four Johns. Yeah. I'm going to keep track now. Okay. Uh, he has a piece of three quarter inch red oak. It's six inch by 32. Okay. And has a bow that he didn't notice before planing it down. What is the best way to get the bow out? No can do. You can't, well, the best way to get the bow out would be to face joint it um, until it's flat and then replane it. So that would make it flat with two parallel faces. Depending on the bow, it might only be half an inch thick by that point. So you can't, if the question is, how do I get the bow out? Like, can I put it between two cinder blocks and weight the middle to flatten it out? It won't happen. Once mother nature takes over, you can't reverse that. Um, so it's something that uh, face joining and playing, planing is the only answer and then um, there's no there's no mechanical means by which you can reverse the bow and still keep it three quarters of an inch thick. All right thanks George. Um, Rick has two questions for you today. Oh my gosh Rick. Always with you Rick. Come on. The first okay. one is the jig that you use to cut dovetail splines on the router table. Okay. Do you have plans for that jig? Well so here's, let me, give you a, let me give you viewers a little bit of advice. Um, since 2007, since 10, in 10 years, October of 2007 was the very first video shoot. I've created about 125 woodworking DVDs and maybe, I don't really know, 800, 1,000 YouTube clips. Um, so the more specific you can be with your question, so the, the point out of this, I'm not trying to be snooty here, but I've probably used more than one dovetail splining jig. Most recently, I used, stay where you are, I'm doing a lot of walking today. Okay. You can get my little tight shot on that one. If that's the one you're talking about, which I think is the most recent YouTube clip I've done with a splining jig a dovetail, with a dovetail bit, this is a commercial product available from MLCS, and I will source it when I sit down and answer the questions. So um, 
no, I don't have plans because it's a commercially made jig. It's not what I built. And I believe, if I remember correctly, Rick had a two-part question. Yep. Um, the second question is, what is a good quality Forstner bit? I have tried to buy some that I thought were good quality from a reputable company, but they don't seem to cut unless I put them in a handheld hand held drill instead of a drill press and wiggled it back and forth a little bit. Thank wow. you, and I'm from Illinois. Um, I've got a set of Porter cable bits here. I've got a variety of other bits, the names of which I really can't remember. Uh, the Porter cable ones cut fine. I think I actually got those at a home center, not a woodworking store. Um, but I would, if you can walk into like a Rockler store or a Woodcraft store or Woodworks in Columbus, Ohio, or you know any kind of a, a retailer that's not a big box store, I would ask them this question of what they have in the store. Um, but if, if you want an endorsement from me on a brand, those Porter cable bits I have, which are probably 10 years old, um, so if they're still made the same, they cut just fine for me. Okay. Um, Frank wants to install some pull-out shelf kits, sliding doors. Okay. Okay. In some existing kitchen cabinets. Okay. Okay. Some kits he's seen online at Rockler have a quarter inch thick mel melamine bottom as the bottom shelf. Okay. okay. The slides for the shelf are rated at uh, 100 maximum? 100, 100 pounds. pounds. Maximum. I'm thinking, Frank is thinking the quarter inch melamine bottom is not substantial enough and would bow with time and weight. Well, let's just have, so, go ahead. Have you built pull out shelves? And if so, what kind of material do you use for the bottom of the shelf? Let's walk this way. Well, actually, yeah, let's do this. Um, just so that people know what we're talking about. This, uh, this little shop cabinet has pull out trays in it. So we need you, Krista, on the lower half of this thing. This is my drill press cabinet. Don't judge me, it's a mess. Um, so there's a pull out tray full of drill bits. In that case, I use three quarter inch plywood for the bottom. I don't disagree with you, especially on the cabinet size you're talking about. I'm assuming 24 is the depth because base cabinets are 24 inches deep. If you're talking about a tray that's 32 inches wide, I would also be very hesitant to use a quarter inch bottom. Um, half inch Baltic birch would be great. If you really want to err on the side of uh, knowing for sure it's going to stand the test of time, use, use three quarter. And you know, think about it, what are you really giving up? Um, the difference between half and three quarter, oddly enough, is a quarter of an inch. So you're giving up a little bit of height, but who cares? What do you put canned goods in there or pots and pans or whatever? I kind of can't imagine that's going to kill you on a space constraint. So. Uh, if you're at all concerned about it, go with three quarter. Okay, great. Uh, we're here with George Von Driska, the managing editor of Woodworkers Guild of America. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Sign up for the newsletter if you don't have it already. And we want to thank Tight Bond Tight for Bond. making this a free program for all of you guys watching. Okay. And gals. And gals. Wayne asked, well, I just say that like indiscriminately. Maybe I shouldn't. Guys, you know, whatever. Wayne asks, well, I just go on a gal watching to feel they're being excluded. Okay. I've been told things when I teach about that I won't go into here that may, has made me very sensitive to people's feelings about how they're addressed. Wayne asked, what brand scroll saw do you have and would you recommend it? If not, which would you recommend? I have, well let's point this way, we're in just the right spot, which you probably did that on purpose. I did that on purpose. Um, I have an Excalibur, which is made by General, I have an Excalibur 21 inch. I like it, that being said, um, I'm not a huge scroll saw guy, so I use it for um, specialized stuff I need to do. My kids have used it. Um, I don't, I think Krista's used it a tiny bit, maybe? I don't know. No. Um, so, sure, I like it plenty. Um, I like its variable speed. Let's see, it's currently not plugged in. Um, but I like that a lot, so I don't have to do a belt change on it. I just dial a rheostat on the top of it, and that gives me my speed control. So as a feature, I love that. Um, but yeah, I like it plenty. Excalibur 21 inch. All right. Um, we're probably going to walk this way. Okay. But I'll read you the question, okay? Peter says, hi. Hi, Peter. I have a glass football paperweight and would like to glue it to a wood face. What glue should I use? The bottom gluing size is oval. It's only like 
one and a half by one inches. Thank you. I'm stuck on something on the floor. Sorry, guys. I did do much sweeping in here earlier today, so that wouldn't happen. But uh, it's quite possible I missed, you know, a piece of sawdust. Okay, I'm gonna have to fix that. Um, I thought you were further back when you hit it, but I don't know. Well, I think I um, it what glue? So, a couple things would bond glass to wood. Um, CA, cyanoacrylate glue, wood. Um, silicone caulk would do just fine. Two-part epoxy would do just fine. Uh, probably one of those three. Between those three, I would probably either use... Um, well, I don't know. I'd be okay with either one of them. You know, honestly, if you've got over the life of this thing, what are you going to ask of it? You're going to glue the football to the base and it's going to sit on somebody's desk or shelf. Um, CA or epoxy or um, silicone caulk, 100% silicone would be just fine. Okay. Any one of those. Great. All right. Finn says, hi, George. Hey, Finn. I'm 14 and I'm from the UK. What type of table saw would you recommend? Thanks from England. Saw stop. Um, now I don't know if saw stop is currently available across the pond, um, but if it is, uh, you can't beat the protection that comes from the brake technology on saw stop saws. It's amazing, and it's one of these things. Saw stop saws are more expensive than other saws, but the first time it saves you from having an accident with your hand, um, they definitely pay for themselves. Um, Outside of that, it would be helpful to know what brands are available over there, because I'm just not, because I don't know. Um, you know, I know when I lived in Africa, um, pretty much none of the stuff I could buy, none of the tools I could buy here were available over there. So um, if you can do a saw stop, do a saw stop. Okay, perfect. Uh, Jonathan says, what's a good humidity level to try to maintain in your shop? My shop is in my garage. Same humidity level as is in your house, whatever that number is. So part of what you're trying to do in this building, in your shop, is emulate the environment that your stuff is gonna live in when it gets wherever it's going. So um, it's hard, you know, in, in this building in the wintertime, it's heated, but I have to be careful about humidification because there is no natural humidity in here. There's no shower, there's no wash machine, there's no dishwasher. So the humidity level is low in here, unless I humidify. Um, so you wanna get heat and humidity at the same level as it's gonna be in the house. All right. Uh, Daniel would like to know, what would be the best top coat for a hickory desk to preserve as much of the original color and character as possible? I am leaning towards a water-based poly right now. Any advice regarding a brand? Thank you. Uh, I've been using uh, water-based lacquer um, from aqua coat for a long time um, very happy with it they make a product they call a cross link lacquer cross link tabletop lacquer um, and i've put that on a gazillion tables including the our dining room table um, so um, i've had great luck with that and i i think you're going in a good direction now here's the thing um, with a lot of water-based products they're very clear so in other words, um, traditional solvent-based products, polyurethane and lacquer, have kind of an amber tone to them that the water-based products don't have. So when I'm using um, water-based, the first thing I put on is de-wax shellac. Mind you, Chris, as long as we're in this deep, um, I think the seal coat, which you've grabbed before, uh, Zinsser seal coat would be in that black finishing cabinet, and then might as well grab any one of those aqua coats off the floor. It'll be a small quart can of seal coat. Um, you just keep talking while I look. Okay, so um, I do a base coat of Zinsser seal coat. That's a de-wax shellac. And that gives it an amber tone. The other thing I gain from that is that, of course, with water-based finishes, when the water hits the wood, it can raise the grain. So, um, that's, that's not the right seal, unless that says seal coat on it, but I don't think it does. You want one of these? No, nope. any one of the aqua coats off the floor would be oh, fine. Okay. I'm looking. Um, so the other thing the shellac does is it seals the wood, so when you put the water-based finish on top, 
the water and the finish isn't getting to the wood and raising the grain. The downside of this, you've got to give that seal coat some time to dry before you put the water base over the top of it, but uh, shellac dries very, very, very fast. That's the stuff. So, two products. Um, step one, seal coat, which is DWAC shellac. That's my undercoat. Then step two, which one is this? This is actually the perfect one. Um, Aqua coat, tabletop cross-linking lacquer um, is a product I put on lots and lots of tables. So um, good durability. So that or the thing you're talking about, a water-based poly, would be a great choice. All right, thanks, George. Um, Steven would like to know, after setting my table saw blade height, the first several cuts are fine, but then the height of the blade decreases several hundredths of an inch. I am using the locking feature on the table saw. Any suggestions? Something is broken. Um, yeah, something, the locking mechanism isn't working, so you need to figure out why. So if it's the hub in the center of the hand wheel, um, I guess I'd start by taking that assembly apart, see if visually you can see what's going on there. Um, it is a little, you know, it's weird, um, and I guess too it depends on what kind of saw you're talking about, but um, I never lock the hub on my saw and it never drops in height. So the only time I lock it in place is if I'm doing dados where the height is really, really critical. But for just general rip or cross cut, um, I set the height, leave it like that without locking the hub and it's just fine. Um, if you're on a bench top saw, I realize it's a whole different kettle of fish, it's a whole different equation. But I, the first thing I would do is look at that locking mechanism because it ain't, it, it's not locking. All right. Glenn from California says, what is a good way to apply poly on furniture? I built a bar and used a brush for several coats, but there are still brush marks on it. Is spraying the only way to get a smooth surface? No. Um, so brush it. Um, type of brush is really, 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 really critical. Um, you want a brush with what's called a chisel tip, and it's just like what it sounds like. Um, give me a second. And here's the thing, like, like a lot of tools, the brushes that you're using are critical to get good work out of them. So um, it could very well be you gotta go to a specialty store, a Sherwin-Williams or Hirschfields or something rather than a home center to get what you want. The other thing to pay attention to is the type of bristle. And um, now my, my, I'm fa my memory is failing me, but, um, Man-made bristles are good for either water-based or solvent-based. Natural bristles are good for either water-based. There's, there's a distinct bristle type that's best for solvent-based and a distinct bristle type that's best for water-based. And it's natural bristles or man-made bristles. So research that. Then with a chisel tip brush, if we're looking at it end on, there's the brush, there's a ferrule, there's the handle. And the chisel tip is gonna look kind of like that. It comes to a little bit of a point. So what happens when you're brushing, especially polyurethane, is you can get one very distinct point of contact. And that does gr a great job at eliminating um, brush marks. The other thing you can do is um, thin your polyurethane about 10%. Um, and that'll just help it flow out better. It won't dry, it won't flash quite as fast. And that'll also help it level better before it does start to dry. So yeah, you don't have to spray it. I, uh, I've sprayed polyurethane. It's, uh, it's not a must. Um, you can brush it on if you're careful. Okay. And use a good brush. All right. Um, Gary says, I have made several end grain cutting boards following your videos. Yay. But I have one issue. Uh oh. When I use my router, two and a half horsepower, to flatten the final cutting board, the ends of the cherry are very rough, requiring a lot of sanding to get a smooth surface. The maple survives much better. When you flatten the surface in the video with your router, you don't seem to have this problem. I run my brand new bit, one and a quarter inch diameter, at slow speeds and fast speeds. I've removed about an eighth inch at a time, and I've removed as little as um, 
Well, I don't even know how to say it. Well, a 16th or a 30 uh, 30, second or... 30 of an inch at a time, neither of which seems to make a difference. What am I missing? Uh, maybe, so maybe the bit type. Um, let's, uh, let's pivot and walk so they're not just staring at blank space for an extended period of time. Head for the CNC drawer here. In the perfect world, you will use. Oh, I was going to show them all your bits. Well, that's fine. Okay. And that's mm. the scary thing is that's not all the bits because the router table drawer has more. These are just the CNC bits. Um, am I in the right spot? Or are you in the right yeah. spot? Yeah, perfect. So this is a bottoming bit, and because it's got these cutters on it. So let's do, sorry, I'll throw you off there. You do that. As opposed to this bit, or ones like it, do, do not have cutters across the bottom. So this cutter, or a fly cutter, which is here, same concept. Bits like this or this are going to give you a better surface finish than bits that look like that. Okay. And that would be my, it sounds like you're doing everything else right. That would be my first suggestion is try a different cutter. Okay, perfect. Let's read the next one. Oh, and Gary is from South Pasadena, California. South Pasadena. Yep. Um, I'm, Greg is in the process of building some small four by four by 12 inch boxes out of white oak. He had originally planned to join the sides of the box using hand cut dovetails, but the process of resawing and planing them didn't go as smoothly as he had hoped. The sides are now only about five sixteenths of an inch thick. Would dovetails still be appropriate or are the sides too thin, thin for this joinery method? Well, dovetails would be fine. I, ironically, I think, and I'm not, I have hand cut dovetails. I don't do it often, um, but ironically, I think that your the thinner material is going to make it harder to get good dovetails. Um, I would at this point maybe lean toward a finger joint um, like this. Um, you could do that on the table saw or the router table. Um, and I think too, in such thin stock, you're going to spend a fair bit of time hand cutting dovetails in, but you're not really going to see that they're dovetails. Um, so I appreciate the sentiment, um, but I think I, I'd maybe try something else. I, I would try, I would do a finger joint if it were me. All right. Steve from Connecticut says, what glue will allow a long working time? I used type on three on a cabinet project and the glue on the plywood panels started setting up prior to having all the sides in place. Uh, yeah, so you want a slow tack time. So did you use type on three because it had to be waterproof? Um, Regular tight bond has a little bit longer tack time than three. Um, two, I believe, is the fastest of all of them. Let's look. Let's see if we can find a glue bottle. I'm pretty sure we can. Am I following you? Yeah, please. And I'm trying to remember. I sort of thought. Maybe not. I kind of thought Type Bond had a. Uh, I kind of thought Type Bond had a slow tack time glue, but standing here looking at the glue I have, I don't see one. Yeah. So if I would say, if uh, if you don't need to be waterproof from three, then I would go with original. I think that'll give you the best. Um, That'll give you the longest working time. All right. Thank you, George. All right. So our next question comes from another John. Five. Yes. Where do you get your knife kits? And I really enjoy your website. And I was wondering, what do you do with your projects when you're done with them? Do you sell them? Uh, well, <laughs> that's funny. It is funny. Um, so we'll get back to the funny part in a second. I get my most of my knife kits come from Jance Supply. 
I'll put this in the answer when I answer the question later. I'll put the link to their site. Um, they've got lots and lots and lots and lots of stuff. Um, the kits we recently did for the Boy Scout group I went to New Mexico with, those came from Rockler. Um, they've got a pretty good selection of knife kits, um, so they're also worth checking out. Projects and videos, um, I have great intentions, which is typically, so here's the, here's the thing. You'll see in the video like a project get built and completed, generally. Um, what it takes to get to that point is six projects or so that are partially completed. Because the video crew is not going to stand here and watch glue dry or whatever. Um, so when they walk in the door, I've got parts in various stages of completion. And um, by the end of a video shoot then, there are like, I don't know, anywhere from one to six partially completed projects all over the shop. What I have learned is that I'm too busy to go back and finish them. So step one is I'll ask people if they want them. Um, step two is, uh, probably step one is I ask my kids if they want them. Step two is I'll ask people if they want them. Um, sometimes the video crew leaves with them. Um, step three is I get rid of them. I give them away, I take them to a recycling store. I, worst case, you know, if it's, if it's a cabinet carcass that still needs 80 hours to be finished, it goes in the dumpster. Because I know historically, I'm never going to get to it. When I moved into this building, um, I took 3,000 pounds of stuff to a dump. Um, some of that was projects I intended to finish someday, material I intended to use someday, you know, scraps, who doesn't save scraps? Um, I am not going to get strapped with 3,000 pounds of stuff again. So um, today I'm way more um, careful about jettisoning what I don't need. Let's, I want to show them quick this stuff, Krista, because it's kind of interesting, I think. Um, I'm working on a project, let's, let's look at this tabletop. Um, I'm working on a project where the customer wants it to look weathered when it's done. So the project is made from red oak that looked like this, and now it looks like this. So uh, put in the comments what you think, if you like that or not. You know, it's what the customer asked for, so they're gonna get it. But it's, it's creating a weathered look. It's turning the oak gray as though it lived outside for a long time. I intentionally used uh, number one common, so that's why there are knots in it, to give it that more rustic feel. Um, so yeah, I don't know, let me know what you think. It's it's interesting stuff. Oh, I can't go that way. All right. What, you can do this, spin. I can spin, yeah. Uh, Lawrence has a question, so, ready? Hit it, Lawrence. He recently purchased a Stanley number four smoothing plane. First plane ever. Um, Lawrence is having a difficult time getting it tuned in. It either cuts too much or not enough. I can't get it to the point where it cuts paper thin like others I've used in woodworking classes. I've been through your mini videos on the website. Any tips on the sequence of steps I ought to take? Tip number one, ask someone besides me. Um, Just wait till the next question, you're gonna love it. Okay. Um, I, I am conceivably the least hand tool oriented woodworker in the world. Um, Matt Cremona, Mark Spagnuolo, Wood Whisperer, um, Jay Bates. Um, there are a lot of people out there who know a whole lot more about hand tools than I. Um, my running joke is that my hand tools live in a cabinet with a glass door, and on the glass it says, in case of emergency, break glass. Um, so yeah, with the finessing a hand plane to make it do the voodoo it's supposed to do, I ain't your guy. But Mark or Jay or, uh, yeah. Matt will be able to help you out. Andy wants to know if you had any two hand planes at all, which two would they be? Uh, hand planes with power cords would be. So I, I for a long time was really on the hunt, and not really on the hunt, because you can get them, I found them. A Stanley 113, I really had a thing for that. It's a plane that actually does concave. It's for making barrels, I think. Um, and there are dials on it that you can turn that control the radius of the sole. And just the mechanics of that I thought was so cool. I probably never would have cut a stick of wood with it. Um, I do use, I use scrapers a lot. Um, and I use block planes a lot. So I, I've had this block plane since forever. I have no idea when I got it or where I got it. Um, but little, little block planes like this I do use all the time. Low angle, 12 degree uh, block planes. 
Um, and I've got a scraper plane somewhere. There's the frequency with which I use it. So um, I've got a scraper plane I use, um, so I don't have to use a handheld scraper. But other than that, yeah, I just I just ain't your guy for plane questions. Okay. Uh, Lindsay wants to know what is the best, quickest way to sand a long cylinder shape? Is there an electric sander that can handle this job? Oh, a lathe would be great. Um, mm -hmm. So you want an electric sander that will like presumably then not put facets on the cylinder. I don't know, that's going to be tough because any electric sander is going to have a flat pad on it. Um, they would conform to some extent. Well, let me, let me riddle, riddle me this. Um, let's see, you stay here. Okay, while he's gone, I'm going to do another commercial. We work here with George Von Driska, Managing Editor of Woodworkers Guild of America. He's just stepped away. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Sign up for the free newsletter if you don't already subscribe to it. And we want to thank Type Bond, the pros advantage, for sponsoring this video and keeping it nice and free for everybody watching. Very good. Almost perfect on time. Um, what about this? Lindsay, right? Lindsay. Yeah. Um, what about this? This is a flutter sander or mop sander. Each of these is a piece of abrasive and then they're, so they're maybe two and a half inches wide and they're I think six inches long. And the ends are already cut into fingers. So you put them on in an alternating pattern so you get this big squishy mop. So then you can do this. Um, this is how I sanded the funky legs on those tables I was just talking about. Um, I think that might be a good solution, and uh, I will source that in the answer. This is a baseball bat blank, waiting to be turned into a baseball bat someday, when I have spare time. So like never? Never happened. Now, I will replace my guitar first. That's a fact, Jack. Chuck wants to know, do you have recommendations for improving finishing skills? I bought a book and it seems way overly complicated. Take a class at a woodcraft store, a rockler store, a tech college. It's, you just can't be, um, you can't be being in a room with somebody. I mean, I clearly I do a lot of stuff by video, by internet, by streaming, by DVD. Um, but finishing is, is dicey and uh, I would look in your area for a finishing class, even if it means going to a tech school for a little bit, um, if they have an evening class or something you could take. Um, and I think that's a great way to go. We do have um, a basic finishing class on WWGOA, and it is, um, it's really a primer on different kinds of finish, more so than applying the finish. So what, what's the benefit of lacquer versus polyurethane versus oil versus shellac? Uh, pigment stain versus um, gel stain. Um, what's the deal with aniline dyes? So it's really more informational about those products than it is about um, necessarily applying the product. So um, you can check that out, um, the WWGOA class, but um, if you can take a hands-on class someplace where you can really accurately ask questions back and forth, that'd be a great way to go. All right, thanks George. Um, Wayne is moving soon and he has to set up his whole small workshop all over again. Space is limited. What type of table saw do you recommend that is set up from basic? Oh, it says a new table saw that is a step, oh, a step up from basic. A step up Sorry. from basic. Well, again, it's hard to not recommend a saw stop. Um, if you don't want to pull the trigger on a saw stop, um, then Hybrid saws are good. So a hybrid saw is a cabinet saw with kind of a contractor saw mechanism mechanism in it. So it's still they're still typically 110 volt. So you don't have to do any special wiring for them. The cabinet gives them better dust collection than a contractor saw. Um, so they have good. Um, they're a good crossover between a cabinet saw and a contractor saw. Um, Joe has not a woodworking question, but he's just saying it's a comment. He just logged on. Oh, he's so disappointed. What happened to your mustache? I shaved, shaved it. it off. So I went on a uh, 
If you're following me on Instagram, you know I was in the mountains of New Mexico. I was gone for 18 days. We were backpacking for 11 um, with the scout troop, with my kid. Um, so right before the trip, I did a really short haircut and I did a really short haircut. And I thought, well, I'm shaving my mustache off. I'm gonna be gone for three weeks, who cares? And if I really hate having it off, I just won't shave for the three weeks that I'm gone. Um, but I kind of like having it off. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure I had a mustache for 30 years. So my upper lip wanted freedom. And uh, now that it's off, I'll go another 30 years without it. And I'm 56 now, so we'll see what happens when I'm 86. I don't know. Kirk wants to know, threaded inserts or just screws? Is one stronger than the other? How deep should the hole be for an insert? Should the insert bottom out in the hole or should the hole be deeper to have extra room for the bolt to pass all the way through? Well, um, Loaded question. Well, a threaded insert will, I'm gonna use the word always, but I'm thinking for a second, but I think it's safe to say a threaded insert will always give you more holding power than a wood screw. Um, great example, when Ginny and I built her electric guitar, the neck was a screw on neck and it called for just wood screws going through the body into the maple neck. That made me squeamish, so we did threaded inserts um, to get a better bite and to make it more repeatable. So that thinking you might take the neck off, tweak it, put it back on, those threaded inserts are gonna make it way easier to on and off, on and off, on and off. Um, do they need to be deeper than the threaded insert itself? It depends. No, if the screw can go into the insert and doesn't need to go beyond it, then you know the, the only holding power you have is the threads in the insert. Once it's beyond the insert, you're not gaining anything anymore. So it can be a blind hole with just the insert in it um, and the insert bottomed out in that blind hole if that works for the screw that you're putting in it. What am I forgetting here? There's like 14 questions. Um, should the hole be deeper to have extra room for the bolt to pass all the way through the insert? If it needs to. Okay. Or buy a shorter bolt. Then you got them all. Okay. Okay. Um, Bill wants you to know he is watching from rural Columbia. Wow. Thanks, Bill, for that. Hola. Como esta? It's almost the extent of my Espanol. Pero... Go on. <laughs> oh. Harry loves your shows. Thanks, Harry. He loves the content he's purchased. Um, he's also really new to finishing and wants to know. It's a finishing kind of a nightmare. Yeah, time. if he can use polyurethane over oil, or should I just go with an oil based wipe on finish? I do not know. And I'm always, uh, I think we had this exact question about two lives ago, yeah, and I'll give so. the same answer, which is I hate to answer finishing questions that I am not like 800% sure of because um, there's just too much at stake. And uh, what I would do is, on the back of that can of polyurethane, there's a customer service phone number, and I would call them and say, I'm thinking of putting linseed oil on and then putting this product over the top, is that gonna work? And let them tell you the answer. Um, I'm, I'm just not confident enough, and it's not something I've done. Um, and what was the other part of that? Or should I just get a poly? Um, a wipe on. Yeah, it's, once you know if once you know poly over oil would work, then I would do I would do that on whatever wood you're fixing to use. Then I would do the poly alone on the other one and see which look you like better, which effect you like better, and base your decision on that. Okay. It's um, always good to experiment with so the finish. We're about ten minutes away from the end. We are. So I know you would like to know where people are viewing from. It's, it is nice to know where people are viewing from. So this would be your opportunity to tell us. And we're gonna get through as many of these last questions as possible, and George will stay after and answer every single one I of your questions. I always have to stay after school and do homework. George would like to know. But the little known fact is that when I'm answering questions and I'm not working in the shop, I can have a beer. So, that's the payoff. George. Or a gin and tonic. George would like some tips for resawing hemlock planks on a table saw. His bandsaw is not big enough for resawing. Let's resaw something on the table saw for Pete's sake. Hemlock, that's a great wood. Uh, that's cool. So let me find something. Is there, is there, I know we're short on time. Is there another question you can throw out while I'm looking for a piece I can resaw? No. All right, there's no more questions? No, there's a lot of more oh, questions. But there's nothing that lends itself to. No.
How about this? Herb is an experienced woodworker, but at 81 years old, his shop is part of his living room. He can't, he can't have a table saw. Is there another small tool he can use to rip wood? Um, um, ripping wood. A handsaw, uh, small bandsaw, bench not bandsaw might be a good solution for her. All right, let me, uh, I'm just going to do a rip here to straighten this other edge out. Uh, you're, in, you're in a good spot because the guard is going to come off. I know, I can't see past the cord though. Oh. Or the hose, I mean. That's going to come out of the way. Okay. All right, all I wanted to do there was give you, or give me, two parallel edges. So we're not to resawing technique yet. I'm gonna shut my computer down. All right, anything else while we're, I'm gonna put in a well, driving knife. I can't resaw with the splitter on. Have so. you, do you know anything about the take apart bandsaw blades? No, never heard of them. Okay, so Lindy, he doesn't know anything about them, sorry. And we have a question from someone who wants to know what's the easiest way to join wood panels together seamlessly, but I don't know if you can answer that right now. Well, you got to joint an edge on each piece, and then seamless comes from matching grain and color. Um, and generally, it's good to have extra parts to make that happen, so that because some pieces just won't lend themselves, um, they don't have a good color or grain match, so you want to swap something else out. Um, I gotta run over here. Or over here. I am literally running. He's literally running across his shop right now, guys. And no, gals. No sharp objects in my hand. Okay, so resawing on the bandsaw, we've got our table saw. There's a three inch capacity to that blade. I wouldn't do all three inches at one time. I would do this in little baby steps. So let's start about an inch and a quarter high. Set the fence. And then magnetic feather board. So with that, I can lock that in place. And that's going to help hold that against the fence. Notice the feather board is in front of the blade. So it's not pushing against the side of the blade. Power back on, then we need some uh, safety stuff. And after you do this one, I'm going to ask you a question that I think might go along with this. Okay. From a different viewer. After this cut, you mean? Yep, after this cut. Okay. Well, this will be a series of cuts, but we'll see what happens. I know. Just on my riving knife. Live television, live internet. Micro adjust, there we go. And then rotate the same face as to stay against the fence. How does the other question fit in? Um, well, Dennis wants to know, after he's edged and planed his board and starts ripping it on his table saw, it starts to close in on itself, jamming the blade. And if he manages to rip it right through, uh, it's completely warped. Okay. Uh, related in that we're on the table saw, yes. unrelated to what we're doing now. So I'll talk about that. I will answer that question for Dennis. So I'm gonna increase the height of my blade now. We could at this point be done, and you could take this board to the bandsaw, and you could just follow these curves with a quarter inch bandsaw blade and finish that resaw. Or we can raise the blade a little and do this again. Okay, 
brake don't slip. question. So with um, wood that's pinching, that's not you or the table saw or the jointing or the planing, that's the material. That is wood that hasn't been dried properly. So um, it's typically, it's what's called case hardening, which means the outside of the material is one moisture content, the inside of the material has a different moisture content. So when you start to cut into it and you open up that core, it starts to react and pinch. Um, so if, if this is a consistent problem, you need to get your material from someplace else. If you're buying, um, if you're buying construction grade material from a lumber yard or a home center, and you're trying to rip it and make projects out of it, you're probably going to run into that all the time because construction grade stuff just isn't dried. It's, it's dried, but it's not dried as uh, meticulously or carefully as um, hardwoods would be. Okay, so we have approximately <clears throat> three minutes left. One but who's more, counting? One more question? Well, oh, depends on the question. Gary said that is the bit he's been using. I think he's the one that was oh, doing the, the, with the... Oh, with the end grain cutting board. I think board. so, yeah. Um, boy, I don't know then. Um, let me... Boy, I hate to run all the way to the other end of the shop, but I will. Let's do a question and then I'll... I've got a cutting board sitting here, Gary, that I can show you and we can compare cut quality. Okay. So um, the last one we're going to ask, and remember guys, there's a lot more. If we don't get to them, George is going to go through and answer them at the end. Or not if we don't get to them, but apparently well, when we're we are not get going to, to get to them. I'm sorry. We're not going to get to them. Okay. Dan has a 10 inch table saw. His daughter bought him a six inch stack dado as a gift. I think I will be okay with a six inch, but I wonder if I should be, if I would be better off with an eight inch blade, what would you suggest? I'm new to woodworking, so any advice would be greatly appreciated. I think you'll be fine. So the, um, here's what you can do. If you wanna leave the six inch in its package until you know what you're doing, um, take a piece of cardboard, cut a six inch circle, and put a five eighths inch hole in the middle, and put that on your saw arbor, and then see how high, then raise the blade, or raise the arbor and see how high it comes out of the table. And the question that's answering is, what's the deepest dado you can cut with that six inch blade? Then you can extrapolate an eight inch blade, if you got an eight inch dado head, would cut one inch more because there's one inch different in radius, two inches different in diameter. Um, and realistically, if you're primarily gonna do case joinery, you're gonna cut a lot of dados that are quarter, um, three eighths, maybe a half inch deep, and a six inch dado is going to be just fine. Um, it is. I've got an eight inch dado, but I could count on one hand the occasions where I've had it an inch and a quarter out of the table. It's very. I, I'm when I do that, it's because I'm doing a cross having joint, and I just don't do it that often. So um, honestly, a six inch is probably going to serve you just fine. Are we running back across the shop? I am. Am I standing here or am I going back? You can back? stay there and you might as well shout out another question while I'm walking. Um, another question? That means I have to scroll all the way back to the bottom. Let me see. Hey, what's the best way to control sawdust in a small workshop? Get a dust collector. Get a dust collector. And do you have a recommendation on the best CNC for a restricted budget? Well, I don't know what one person's restricted might be somebody else's. Oh, big buckets, that's a lot of money. Um, yeah, I, don't, I mean, yeah, I just don't know. It depends on your price point. And 
the size of bed you want and what you want to cut and quarter inch collet, half inch collet, spindle versus round. There, there, there's a lot of stuff, so it'd be a really hard one to answer. Um, walnut, maple, cherry, Gary. So um, who knows what kind of, I'm just gonna set that there and Krista okay. can zoom, 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 zoom. Um, so that's what I'm getting off of that cutter. So you tell me if that's better, worse, or the same as what you're getting. Um, if, if mine is significantly better, then maybe a little slower feed rate. Um, but he said he went slow. Yeah, I thought so. So then I'm then I'm I'm sorry, but I'm just not sure what to tell you. All right, Gary. I hope that helps you out. All right. Is there one more short answer question, and then we can cut them loose, or do we do we know where people are watching from? Do we what's happening there? Yep. Um, people are watching from all over the world. All right. Well. <laughs> all right. All over the United States, Colombia, United Kingdom, you know. There's a lot of like big long questions that have just come in at the end, so. All right, so a couple things. Um, generally at the end here, one wrap up is, big thank you to Titebond for sponsoring this, so it's free for all you viewers. Um, where is George next? Um, end of September, I'll be teaching CNC classes at the Woodcraft store in Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, I'm there for either two or three days, I'm not sure, but it's on their website. Um, in October, I'll be teaching at Feral Equipment, that's also here in Wisconsin. Um, and I think there's another one in there. Oh, and also in September, I'll be uh, doing a turning demo at the Minnetonka Rockler store. Minnetonka's just outside of Minneapolis, St. Paul. I'll be there all day on the it's right around September 16th. It's on the uh, Von Driscoll Woodworks website. If you go there, um, the specific date is there and the store locations. In fact, all my teaching gigs are there. So that's kind of what's happening in my teaching world in the next couple months. Um, as always, if there's a venue in your area that you would like to bring me into, talk to me, talk to them, and we'll get something worked out and see what happens. Um, other than that, maybe time to go away here and uh, shut this down. Our next live is September is 14th. September 14th. At 7 p.m. Central Time. 7 p.m. Central Time. We're, yeah. As much as possible, it will be the second Thursday of the month at 7 p.m. unless I'm out of town. Yeah, I think that's it. All right. Well, thanks for watching. I'll sit down now and answer questions I didn't get to, but uh, I think we did answer a boatload of them. Uh, thanks to Krista for running the camera. Thanks for Sam behind the scenes, who does a great job of feeding questions and getting this whole thing to work um, from her secret haven somewhere. I don't even know where she is, but she has a secret haven, so that's cool. Other than that, peace out, baby. I think this is all done.